Mara O'Connor, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Brett. I appreciate it. So you uh, got a book out called Wayfinding. It's all about human navigation and the history of navigation and how navigation makes us human. I'm curious, was there something that like that's behind this book? Like you had a personal experience that you're like, I need to start researching and writing about human navigation. Yeah, I definitely didn't think much about this topic until I was kind of using my smartphone and my GPS for a long time. I had a first generation iPhone and I was using it as a journalist to get around New York and, you know, track down interviews and chase stories as a newspaper reporter. And I really trusted my smartphone. I mean, it is an incredibly powerful tool. But then I was on a trip in rural New Mexico, very different from, you know, Brooklyn or Manhattan where I live. And I wanted to go to a hot spring. And so I was with my partner and I put in the name of this place into my smartphone and we followed these directions down these, you know, increasingly (laughs) shrinking dirt roads. And finally, you know, the phone took us to the edge of the Rio Grande River in this like hundred foot cliff that just went straight down to, to the water. And I guess this, you know, hot spring was somewhere at the bottom of that cliff, but obviously we had no way of getting there. And, you know, since then I kind of collected these stories about, you know, the crazy links that people will go just because they put so much faith into their GPS. And I also started realizing I just didn't really know what we are doing when we navigate, you know, what's happening in the brain when we try to get from A to B. And as a science journalist, I just felt that this was a topic that offered a lot. It offered me a way to think about the impact of a technology on our lives, but also to think about neuroscience and culture and, you know, what might be lost when we outsource this skill to a device. So let's talk about the neuroscience here. Let's begin there. Like, what do we know? Like, what do scientists know about what goes on in our brain when we navigate? Like, are there specific parts that we use? Yeah, there's a really fascinating part of the brain called the hippocampus that we use when we are orienting ourselves in space and getting from A to B. So we have these multiple sensory systems that include vision and touch and even smell that seem to converge upstream, so to speak, of this part of the brain, the hippocampus. And all of that information is passed on to what are called place cells. And these are cells that were discovered by a neuroscientist by the name of John O'Keefe, and he won the Nobel Prize for this research in 2011. And so most of what neuroscientists know about place cells are from rat studies. So, you know, there's this kind of classic study where you put a rat in a maze. And what these neuroscientists are able to do is attach single electrodes to these place cells and see that they fire in correspondence with where that rat is in physical space. And then there's other cells in this part of the brain. There's cells called head direction cells and grid cells. But the most interesting thing about the hippocampus to me is that it's not just where this knowledge of space, where we build spatial representations is kept. It's also where we have what's called episodic memory, which is our recall of all the events of the past that we remember. It's kind of the locus of our autobiography. And we don't really know which came first, memory or these so-called cognitive maps in the brain. So there's a connection. We're we're going to talk about this throughout this discussion. There's a connection between memory and navigation. If we can't remember things, we wouldn't be able to navigate. And maybe if we can't navigate, we can't remember things. Exactly. And and like I said, we're not sure which came first, but it's a fascinating question. Did humans have better memories because we had this hippocampus and then we started using memory as a strategy for navigation? Or, you know, was it that in our long, long distant evolutionary past, we had to navigate a lot in search of food, shelter, other people, and then we sort of adapted and started using our hippocampus to start keeping memories of the past. Well, and throughout the book, you go and visit what we'd call traditional cultures, right? Where like, Inuit Indians, the Aborigines in Australia, where they are still using traditional methods of navigation. And you start off with the Inuit and, and how they navigate traditionally. And some, there, there's insights there about how we use our memory to navigate. 
Yeah, I went to Nunavut in the Canadian Arctic. And, you know, I'll say that there are hunters in Nunavut who are using very, very modern tools and technologies to, to get around. So they're driving snowmobiles, you know, they're using guns, not harpoons. But then there are, are some who are increasingly you know, cognizant of the idea that navigation is also integral to aspects of culture that they don't want to let go of. So um, traditional navigation is increasingly being taught to a younger generation, not just because it helps them survive on the land, but because it's a point of cultural pride. It has to do with history, language, land stewardship. And one of the first people that I spoke to in Nunavut was a hunter and community leader by the name of Solomon Awa. And I asked him, you know, one of my first questions was, you know, what makes the Inuit so superior when it comes to navigating in this Arctic landscape, which to people from the South, which is anybody who's, you know, kind of below the Arctic circle makes it so difficult. It just looks kind of blank. It's, it's snow and it's ice. And he right away without hesitation said, you know, we have bigger memories than you. And he attached that to the fact that traditionally Inuit culture is an oral culture. So from the time that you're young, you are memorizing stories, you're memorizing routes. There's more need for you to have a bigger memory than in perhaps other places in the world. And and also another thing about the Inuits, like they notice things that like we wouldn't notice, right? Like we would go to the Arctic Circle like, man, this looks, everything looks the same they would actually say, no, there's like a difference here and they are able to pay attention to that difference. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that the Arctic landscape is totally homogenous, but there are places there where you don't have you know, huge kind of mountainous landscapes. It can be incredibly flat. It can, if you're traveling on sea ice, there may not be very many landmarks whatsoever to distinguish, you know, one part of the ice from another. And so what you see are these, uh, you know, amazing strategies where Inuit hunters are using things like the patterns um, on the snow that are created by wind. And if you know the direction of the dominant wind, you can read these like a compass in the ground, or you might use a rock, you know, here in Manhattan, I can look at the Empire State Building and can say, okay, I know that's north of me, you know, but in the Arctic, there are no Empire State Buildings, but you could use a rock instead. And, and their capacity for attending to detail is really incredible. So they might not just use the shape of a rock, but also the pattern of lichen and moss to remember, oh, I came this way and now I know that I'm on the right track. So a memory, so the Inuit basically from the time they're little kids, they're learning these stories that tell them how to navigate that landscape. But, and this is happening in our hippocampus, which is connected to navigation and memory. But as you highlight in the book, there's two ways to navigate. Like there's, there's two strategies our brain uses to navigate. Uh, what are those two strategies? Yeah, neuroscientists call them different circuits. And so the most important is sort of what I was describing with the hippocampus and place cells. And that's the spatial learning strategy. We learn to navigate using the relationships between landmarks and that information and those spatial representations are held in the hippocampus. And when we return to a place we've already been, those same place cells are firing in the same pattern. Those are that's what is in a sense formulating our cognitive map. And once we have that map, it allows us to create novel routes to any destination from any starting position in the environment. So it's a little confusing, but that's what's called an allocentric perspective. It's the kind of bird's eye view of the environment and the ability to infer relationships from different landmarks and create new routes. Then there's this other circuit which is very different. And it's really about habits and it's called the caudate nucleus. And it's how we get around to really familiar places. It's kind of like being on autopilot. So it sort of signals to us to turn right and left in response to a cue without us really having to think about it or having to use our memory to figure it out. And you can see why evolutionarily that might have been really useful. You know, it allows us to sort of 
get to the supermarket in our neighborhood without having to retrieve our memories. And it kind of allows our mind to wander and attend to other things. What's really, I think, interesting is that we use one strategy over the other, but we never use them at the same time. So the more we use one, the less we use the other. And as we age, we seem to use these hippocampal spatial strategies less and less. And that corresponds in many cases to sort of decreased volume in this part of the brain. And the concern is whether or not, you know, we are in fact impacting our memory capacities, the, the vigor of our memory, if we're not really exercising the hippocampus and its spatial strategies enough. Well, like that second strategy, and we'll talk more about this later in detail, but that second strategy of the queue, that's basically Google Maps, right? It's like you're, you got your phone on, it says turn right here, turn left there, and you just follow it. You have no bird's eye view of where you're at. Yeah, I think what I think the important difference to think of is that when we're using the turn by turn function of our, you know, Google Maps or smartphone, we are not having to create or utilize our own spatial representations of the landscape around us. And so we we are essentially just following the directions, you know, that are supplied to us turn right, turn left. It's not a one to one analogy with the that second strategy it's a there's it's a little more complex than that but i think it's a really good yeah a uh, parallel to draw and distinction to make when we are using our turn by turn directions on our gps device we really aren't using that hippocampal spatial strategy and so you know yeah, that's the question. What's the impact of that? And there aren't a lot of long-term studies to tell us yet, but the sort of initial studies that have been done are fascinating. And the, the short answer is, you know, it could have sort of nefarious effects on, on our memory and, and other skills. Well, this idea, this connection of uh, spatial um, navigation to memory, you suggest can, in the book, explain, partly explain childhood amnesia, right? Which is the idea that at a certain point in our childhood, like we don't remember anything, right? You can maybe go four, maybe three, and then after that, you can't remember anything. How could navigation possibly explain that? Yeah, I mean, I know some people scoff when I bring this up and they say that they can remember things from when they're one or two. And that actually, that may be the case. Um, you know, I certainly can't. And I had this experience in my own childhood where I don't have a lot of memories from before I was about five or six. And then it's like, I can remember everything. I have these very vivid memories that often take the shape of maps almost of like where I can recall, you know, the rocks or the trees that I used to climb on. And I can remember, you know, where I got the bus to go to school. And I was, you know, really interested in why this was. So I was talking to neuroscientists and they're the ones who sort of said, yeah, there's this phenomenon called infant or childhood amnesia. So the idea is like one theory that, one reason we don't have these very vivid memories from our childhood is that our hippocampus isn't fully developed. And it's as children are exploring space and sort of creating spatial representations in the brain that they're kind of training the hippocampus and its ability to retain memories so that by the time they're six or seven, their memories are actually, you know, fully functioning. They're not perfect. But so there's this kind of idea that through childhood, there's a process of cognitive development. And it raises the question of, you know, how important is the idea of exploration, independent play, and self-locomotion, you know, th them walking, not being carried even, and how that might be an essential part of cognitive development and, and maturation. Uh, and I think that's really important right now, because we know that, you know, we are increasingly a risk adverse society, not just in the United States, but there's been studies done in Japan, Australia, Europe, in many parts of the world where children are really limited in their independence. Um, and it's such a drastic change from just even two or three generations ago. And so, yeah, there, there could be, I mean, it's all uh, tenuous uh, theories. Like they, by not allowing kids to explore, we might be stunting hippocampal development, which could affect memory. 
Perhaps. I mean, we don't know what the the offshoots are of of limiting independent play and autonomy and the time that children are allowed to just sort of freely play outdoors. You know, I think even if there's no studies pointing to directly, you know, cognitive problems as a result of that, I think, you know, it's it's important to ask, you know, should children know that Google isn't the only way to find information and that GPS is the isn't the only way to to get somewhere, you know, what's the importance of self-reliance and autonomy and not needing to be dependent on these devices in their lives um, and being able to figure it out. And yeah, I think spatial spatial knowledge is is important for even intelligence. It's it's problem solving, it's grit, you know, it's all these things that we want children to have in order to succeed and um and be fulfilled human beings. And it does seem like in some ways these devices could compromise that. Let's talk about how other animals navigate, because I think that can give us some insight on how humans navigate. You see the difference, because we've all heard those stories of animals that travel thousands of miles. And like, like the salmon, they were born thousands of miles away from their homeland, but they're able to swim back to the same place where they were spawned. How do animals navigate, and how is that different from what, what humans do? Yeah, I mean, I have a whole chapter in Wayfinding about animals, because I was shocked to discover that scientists don't actually know the answers to a lot of these questions of how animals do just unbelievable feats of navigation. And yeah, like you're bringing up salmon and the examples are almost countless. Like you can look at almost any species of animal. Butterflies. Frogs, yeah, butterflies. You know, even like aphids have navigational capacities that we don't fully have explanations for. So, I mean, one thing is, is that if if animals were prone to getting lost, it's likely that their species wouldn't have survived. So it seems through natural selection, different species of animals have created these really sophisticated tools in some cases for for finding their way. And in some cases over, you know, many thousands of miles. So one of the best examples I think is these bar-tailed godwits, this type of bird that travel 6,000 miles over open ocean from Alaska to New Zealand. And if they made a directional error of just even a few degrees, it would mean that they were hundreds of miles off course in the middle of the ocean and they would die. And then there's Arctic terns that travel, you know, 40,000 miles each year from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again. And how they do this has been explained in different ways. And I think is still, like I said, a bit of an unanswered question, but there's, you know, I think the most compelling explanation is this magnetic compass idea that they're able to read the earth's magnetic field what that biological mechanism is that allows them to do that has been so far undiscovered. And there's different theories out there. I think what's fascinating is like, if you compare the capacity of a person to an Arctic turn, we are just the worst. You know, if you put a blindfold on a person and just say, okay, walk in a straight line, they're going to start walking in a circle that's measuring about 66 feet in diameter. But like, they'll tell you that they're walking in a straight line. <laughs> so we just don't have whatever biological mechanism it is that animals have that allows us to dead reckon. But what we do have is memory. And we've created these cultural traditions that connect us to places. And so knowledge and the building of knowledge and the passage of knowledge from one generation to the next and these cultural skills and practices seem to be how we have kind of made up for whatever deficiencies, you know, we have compared to like leatherback turtles. (laughs) Right. Well, and one of those cultural traditions that we've developed is storytelling. Humans are storytelling animals. Like what is uh, storytelling's connection to navigation? Yeah, I think, you know, the hippocampus is this place that, as I said, allows us to have a recollection of events and it allows us to orient in space now in the present moment. And it's also 
amazingly the place that allows us to envision the future. So people who don't have a hippocampus, whether because they suffered some kind of trauma to it, or there's cases of of people having had it removed as a treatment for epilepsy, they have a difficult time envisioning even tomorrow, you know, what they're going to do tomorrow. So I became interested in this idea that we have this narrative capacity of of thinking about the past, the present, and the future, beginning, a middle, and an end because of, of the hippocampus. And I came across the work of this artificial intelligence pioneer at MIT, Patrick Winston, who he sadly passed away last month. But he was interested in a lot of the similar issues like what is the source of human intelligence? And he thought that it was storytelling and that if we can create supercomputers that can understand stories, then we are on our way to creating real artificial intelligence. And so there's just this, I think, really compelling relationship between, you know, who we are as a species and, and how we survive and, and what is part of our rich cultural heritage and storytelling seems to be at the heart of all of that. And I was sort of, you know, delighted and surprised to find someone working in a completely different field, like artificial intelligence who had from a different direction come to some of the same ideas. And as you highlight in the book, a lot of these traditional cultures that still use traditional navigation methods, like the way they pass that along is through stories. Like the Aborigines in Australia, they, they tell stories about like uh, the dream, the dream world, right? Right. And, and that's how they yeah. navigate. Yeah. It's like, you can think of it in the sense that navigation could have helped us to develop this narrative storytelling capacity, but then likewise, humans seem to use stories as a mnemonic device to find our way. And the best example of that is like you said, I think song lines, which, you know, Aboriginal Australians believe that All of the rocks, the trees, the gorges and rivers of the landscape were created by their ancestors who traveled through the world in the dream time. And those journeys are recorded in songs and stories that people learn and memorize. They're, you know, handed down from one person to the next. And I, I think I didn't find a lot that was written on this topic, but um, there's some really compelling, you know, evidence out there that the song lines are, you know, connected to music and and law and land stewardship and Aboriginal culture, but they're also, in a simple way, a mnemonic device for finding your way across the landscape because you are literally have these stories that are describing the routes taken by their own ancestors, you know, so there'll be from this rock, you you'll see these trees and from those trees, you'll see this gorge. And I just found this to be such a beautiful example of how, you know, culture and navigation have intertwined and, and are, it's so rich. And also you see this connection between navigation and narrative as a device to help you remember things like the ancient Greeks had this, like that's how they remember memorize giant speeches. They would actually create like physical maps in their head of like a building. And they'd say, well, now I'm in this room and in this room, I see this thing. And because I'm in this thing, I'm going to talk about this thing and I'm going to move over here. And it's the same sort of thing that they're, they're creating a narrative, but also navigating through an imaginary space. Yeah. And the ancient Greeks seem to have kind of understood this spatial proclivity of the brain, that it's easier to remember things when it's associated with a place. And and the difference, I would say, between what the ancient Greeks were doing with these memory palaces and what Aboriginal Australians are doing when they use the song line as navigating is that, you know, the Greeks are creating imaginary spaces in the brain, but the Aboriginal Australians are using the actual landscape as a memory palace. So maybe that's a little confusing, but I think they're both doing the same thing, as you said, and it's because the brain has this proclivity for an ability to retain spatial knowledge and memory, um, perhaps easier than just abstracted information. So when we travel, we're not only navigating through space, but we're also navigating through time. Is there a connection between space and time when we navigate, like in our brain? Yeah, I think that I start to, I, throughout the research for this book and writing it, I started to think of time as a kind of human construct and as a measure 
of how far we have traveled. And, and one way that one reason why I started thinking like that is because of how much we use the vocabulary of space to talk about time. So, you know, we say it, it was a long time, long, you know, it was a short time, a short time. And there are some neuroscientists who think that the cells in the hippocampus aren't just mapping space, that they may also be mapping time. There's a neuroscientist, Howard Eichenbaum, who actually called them time cells. And so there is this fascinating connection. I think the scientific neuroscientific research in that subject is still growing, but I can't wait to see where it goes in the next 10 years because it may be that our understanding of what the hippocampus is doing has kind of been limited by this focus on rat studies. You know, rats may be really interested in space and humans may also be able to harness the hippocampus to map space, so to speak, but we may also be mapping many other dimensions of our experience. So time being one of them, but maybe also social hierarchies or relationship or even maybe music. Yeah. That I like back to the future captures that idea that time is place, right? It's like, they're not traveling back. They're traveling to the, to the 1950s, like a yeah. place, right? It's like, it's, it's a place, not yeah. just a time. I just watched that movie the other day with my five-year-old. <laughs> oh, you are a great mother. You're, you're you passing thought it was on, pretty cool. You're passing on important <laughs> culture here. I think, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, when we, we, when we navigate time, we're actually probably navigating space in a weird way. Let's talk about language and navigation. How does language influence the way we navigate or how does navigation influence the way we talk or la- our language? Yeah, I think when I started researching the book, I it was hard for me to imagine that there was a way of navigating that didn't rely on maps. You know, maps are so important to Western culture and the idea that you could somehow find your way, especially in a very challenging landscape, like say the Arctic or the desert without a map seemed kind of like beyond my the scope of my own imagination. But what I started talking to different anthropologists about is just how many, you know, the astonishing range of human navigation systems that rely on observation, memory, perception, and environmental cues. So some cultures orient by wind, others by sand, waves, and then some rely on trails, roads, or signage, or maps like like we do. And then I started to realize that even beyond, you know, differences in strategies and environmental cues, there's even differences in in the language and the words that we use from culture to culture to describe space. So, you know, most likely if I were to give you directions from my office to my home, I would say, you're going to take a left out of the front door, go down to the stop sign, take a right, and so on. But in other cultures, they wouldn't even have the words right or left to describe space. So they would have to say, you're going to turn south, go to the stop sign, and then you're going to turn east. And so the question is, does using a language that requires you to know your orientation in space all the time in order to to speak, in order to communicate, make you better at navigating? And all the evidence uh, points to yes. And so there's these incredible studies in the 1970s with this doctor and explorer, David Lewis, where he was going into the Western desert in Australia and going out with community leaders and hunters and trackers. And he would bring individuals to a place and then ask them to point to an unseen landmark, often like a dreaming site that was part of a a, a song line uh, and say, okay, you know, point. And then he would see how accurate they were and they're incredibly accurate. You know, they were, they were sort of able to do it almost flawlessly. And so then, you know, 20 or so years later, Stephen Levinson, a psycholinguist who was studying these differences in language, uh, was doing the same studies. And many of his students went around the world and found examples of, of many other cultures who also use these geocentric terms like east, west, north, and south instead of the, the more egocentric terms of left or right. So there really is this picture emerging of just the incredible cognitive diversity and language diversity in human culture. 
so so far we've sort of weaving this tapestry. As you said, like this book is like a tapestry because you're connecting all these different things. Navigation is connected with memory. Memory is connected to storytelling. Navigation is also connected to storytelling. Language is connected to navigation. You also make this this case that navigation is partly responsible for science, like what we call the scientific theory today. How so? Well, I think the first person who exposed me to this idea was John Huth, who's an astrophysicist at Harvard, but he also teaches this course to Harvard undergrads about navigation. And I just got so interested in why somebody would be teaching, you know, a Harvard seminar on like how to tell, you know, which direction the wind is going from the clouds. <laughs> it would seem like pretty basic, basic knowledge. And, you know, John was talking a lot about how he feels empiricism, this ability to derive knowledge directly from our sensory experience and from our own perception has kind of fallen away in modern education. And so he became really interested in teaching his students these basic skills so that they could develop their own capacity for gathering empirical knowledge and using that as the foundation for then the rest of their scientific knowledge. And he's actually not the first one who's kind of drawn this connection between science and, and navigation. There's a small body of literature out there that talks about how when you're tracking an animal, you are creating hypotheses, you know, from our observations of the world. You're sort of imagining yourself in the place and time of how that animal was traveling through space. And then you're testing that hypothesis against reality. Am I going to find that animal and be able to kill it, to eat it, <laughs> and so on? And so, you know, Huth, John Huth and, and other people who talk about this use that as an example, an early example of the scientific process of creating hypotheses and testing them against reality, of using our empirical ability, our perception and our sensory experience to build knowledge. So if you want to become a better scientist, it sounds like you need to take a, go to a tracking school. Maybe. Maybe. I, <laughs> I think, I think John believes and many of the students that I talked to and I sat in on his classroom feel that this course not only gave them a sense of confidence that they didn't have before, but was also almost like philosophically affecting for them. Like they started thinking not just in terms of how can I you know, find my own way in the world, like that became an existential question for them too. And so that was really interesting for me. And I think the book often does veer into that more philosophical existential territory because of that, you know, we use the metaphors of navigation to talk about our own lives all the time. You know, are we on the right path in life? Have we deviated, you know, have we reached our, you know, our destination? I mean, there's these ways in which the language of navigation helps us to understand the bigger journey of how we move through life, not just how we, you know, get from A to B. Well, let's talk about that. So we we talked about like this, uh, the sort of existential threat possibly of our decreasing ability to navigate without GPS. I think most of us, I think you cited a number, 81% of people in America are using some sort of GPS device to get around. And that's a big increase. I think in 2008, it was something like 10% or 8%. I mean, it was really small. Right. Understanding that navigation is connected to memory, memory to navigation. What are the implications of relying of us relying so heavily on GPS to to get around instead of using that spatial navigation? Well, I think, so I'll start with the more sort of philosophical, you know, argument. And I think if we're always trying to avoid getting lost, if that's our main concern, that me basically means we always have to know where we are going before we set out somewhere. And so in some ways, GPS doesn't really leave room for exploration, for the unexpected, for discovery, you know, for this idea of, of forging our own path, of traveling the less or going on the less traveled road, of this capacity to set off into the unknown and then find out as we go. And that's why I think the term wayfinding is such an interesting term. It, it really, it indicates that 
this isn't just a sort of rational calculation of how to get from one place to the other in the fastest, most efficient way possible, but that it's a process in which as we go, we accumulate knowledge, we, we know as we go. And I'm definitely not advising people to get lost, like, especially in a wilderness situation, <laughs> you know, I think even, you know, Solomon Awa or hunters in the, in the Arctic would just like scoff at that notion. But what I am kind of suggesting is that people maybe think about and turn their attention to how they are finding their way and even developing those navigation skills rather than just almost mindlessly relying on a device that may be shutting off opportunities rather than allowing them. And I don't want to um, dismiss how useful GPS can be in some situations. Some people may feel very uncomfortable, you know, going someplace they've never been before without having a device to help them get there. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But what I'm talking about could be as simple as deciding to go out and create a new cognitive map of a place that they're less familiar with. And that's different from getting lost. It's more about kind of intentional exploration. No, I, I, so I thought one thing I've noticed in my own life about this idea of that, you know, getting lost uh, is an important part of actually figuring out where you are in life. Like I've lived in Tulsa. I moved to Tulsa in like 2006. And so this is when like Google Maps was on the scene. So like when I moved here, like I used Google Maps to get around. Right. 10 years later, like I still don't know, like I'm not very good at navigating Tulsa without Google Maps. Like I, I'm, I've gotten a little bit better, but like, I couldn't do that thing like, well, if I'm here, you can just take this road to get to this part of town. But if I go back to my hometown where I grew up as a kid, like I can get around anywhere. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't need GPS. Like I know how to get anywhere, anywhere. And it's because like I spent my part of my life just developing that mental map in my head of that place. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I had the same exact experience in the end of the book. It's basically me going back to the town more like a village actually is really rural that I lived in from when I was six to about 10 and not using a GPS, not using a map. And I could find my way around as though I had just left yesterday. And similar to your experience, I had a friend, you know, describe to me how he lives in LA now and he cannot get across town without using his phone. And he's like, why is it that I can remember every bike route that I ever took when I was 10 years old growing up in England and I can't find my way to this coffee shop that I've gone to, you know, a couple of times a week for the last like three years or something. And I think that's, that shows how this kind of nefarious quality of using the device, which is that the more we use it, the more we almost depend on it. And so it's a bit of a vicious circle where we actually don't develop the confidence and and literally the memories of places in order to be able to put the device down. And I think so much of it stems from this sense of anxiety. Like we don't have a lot of tolerance for the idea of wasting time anymore. You know, we really, and, and that makes sense. You know, I don't want to get lost on my way to the airport just to like prove a point about wayfinding. <laughs> But if our whole lives and our whole days are being organized around that principle of, you know, putting convenience above other types of experience or putting efficiency and saving time above other types of experience, that's when I start thinking, wait a second, like it's important to maybe step back and think about the value of these other ways of finding, finding our way through space. So another sort of possible downside of relying on navigation as we rely on that more cue response navigations, which is parallel to what we do when we use GPS, we're using our, hip, our hippocampus less. We know that the brain is plastic. So if you use one part of your brain less, it shrinks. What are the possible implications of us like using our hippocampus less to navigate? Yeah. So there's been some, some studies that show brain activity differences between people who are using, say, a paper map and people who are using turn-by-turn -turn directions given to them by 
their GPS device. So there was one in 2017 recently where they gave people, you know, navigating the Soho neighborhood in London, these two different um, strategies. And what happens when people are using those turn by turn directions in the hippocampus is that that part of the brain just kind of seemed to lose interest in the environment. So it was just kind of lost interest, even when they encountered a new street, a new piece of information or a new part of, of their potential cognitive map, they just weren't really interested. And so it seems that that part of our brain's cognitive mapping system isn't really engaged. And then there's other studies showing that people who rely on sat nav devices or GPS devices in their cars, you know, afterwards they can't draw the route with a lot of detail as those who didn't use one can. So we actually seem to be paying more attention to the screen than the environment when we're using these devices in our cars or even when we're walking. And so whether or not that has a direct effect on, say, the vigor of our memory is an open-ended question. But there's simultaneously a very, very large body of research in, say, Alzheimer's disease that shows almost universally for people who have Alzheimer's, they show atrophy in the hippocampus. The same with depression, PTSD, dementia, memory impairments. And so it used to be that neuroscientists thought this was the product of these diseases, the atrophy in the hippocampus. But now they're wondering if the sort of reverse is true. Could this sort of be a predilection for these diseases. And so increasing hippocampal health, you know, in any way that we can seems to be something really positive we can do, especially as we're aging and we tend to rely on habit more and more rather than utilizing these spatial strategies. And I think you, one uh, neuroscientist you talked to said she like doesn't, she tries to use GPS as little as possible because of this possible connection to Alzheimer's. Yeah. I mean, she, Veronique Bobat is in Montreal and she's done, you know, amazing studies, um, looking at the differences between the hippocampus and the caudate nucleus, this other habit strategy of, of navigating. And, uh, and yeah, she has said, and I was speaking with her a few months ago and she's still not using a GPS. You know, I think that a GPS can be useful. And I will use it. I need to use it when I go to New Jersey. I find it really hard to get around New Jersey without GPS. There's like so many highways. (laughs) It's very confusing. So I'm not kind of a purist about this, but I try to pay a lot of attention. So what I'll do is I'll perhaps I'll look at the map on my phone before I go somewhere in the same way that you would look at a paper map. And then I will, you know, in my mind, remember the sequence of directions that I need to take to get where I want to go. And then I will put it away. And so I think that's one way of sort of, you know, using some of the benefits of GPS, which can tell you exactly where you are, you know, (laughs) but also being aware of the fact that, you know, exercising the hippocampus in a very conscious way is, I think, quite healthy. And Veronique Bobat has created almost a whole curriculum for how people can can do that. And it has to do with it with eating well, it has to do with exercise, and it has to do with, you know, consciously creating and exercising our cognitive maps. And some people think, well, relying on a map or a mental map, like that's going to make navigation harder. I've actually noticed in some situations, it's easier to navigate without GPS or the turn by turn because... There's, yeah, you have that instance where, you know, you end up uh, almost running off a cliff in New Mexico. Like that's an extreme case right. when you rely on GPS. But there's also, it's like the annoying thing about it is you only, they only give you directions for like so far, right? So like you might be like, what I've encountered is I'll be like in the wrong lane, right? And I need to be on the, I'm on the left side of the lane. I need to be on the right side of the lane. Yeah. But it doesn't tell you until the last minute. And you're like, ah, crap, I can't get over there now. So I have to like go a mile down and make my, so like if I just would have known in my head, I need to get off of this exit way in ahead, like it would have made navigation or getting to that place a lot faster. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's totally true. I think I, I can't count the number of times where I or someone, you know, that I know has used a GPS and then inadvertently like created more confusion and it's taken 
twice as long or even more to get where you wanted to go. I had a friend of uh, my mom's tell me the story about leaving her house to pick up her friend at the airport, which is an hour away. And then on the way back, it took them four hours to get home. And she could not figure out why. There were times where she was literally driving next to the highway, but she was on like a smaller road that was adjacent to it. And then she got home and realized that her GPS had been set on walk rather than drive. And so, but there's this way in which GPS, because it's so powerful, we suspend our sort of disbelief or our own confidence and our perception and you know, ability to rationally think through these things. And we just are like, if the GPS is saying it, it must be true. And the best example of that I think is in the office where Michael and Dwight are like driving in their car. <laughs> Michael starts driving into a lake and Dwight's saying, stop. And Michael's like, I can't. It's because the GPS is telling him <laughs> to do it. And that's like laughable, but there are countless examples of this. I had someone send me an entire Facebook page that he had created because he teaches truck drivers a safety course. And he created this Facebook page just to document like the number of news stories about truck drivers following their GPS into just ridiculous, insanely unsafe, you know, conditions because they just think if it's saying that it must be true. Yeah. The examples just go on and on. All right. So don't, uh, so maybe use your GPS less. It'll help you get to the place where you want to go faster, but it can also help you become more human in a, yes. in a Rwanda. Battle. So Mara, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, I regularly contribute to the New Yorkers element section, which is their science and, uh, and tech uh, section. And I write about all kinds of stuff, snow leopards, autonomous vehicles. And I also have another book called Resurrection Science, which looks at some of the philosophical questions raised by technology, but in a totally different context, which is that of conservation and biology. So yeah, I encourage people to look at in those two places or also buy a copy of Wayfinding. Fantastic. Well, Mara O'Connor, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was really fun. My guest today was Mara O'Connor. She's the author of the book, Wayfinding. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about her work at our website, mroconnor.info. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash wayfinding, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.